the voice before the void dot net the dangerous forbidden knowledge of no personhood the issue with uh, identity is um uh first there is uh this data that we have from neuroscience um about uh Okay, this come out, yeah, I think it published in the 70s, 80s, um, where we got, like, these cases that, you know, constituted them, like, enough data for people to, to write about it. Um, uh, and these cases were, um, uh, it, it was epilepsy, so there was this, discovered there was a, an effective treatment for severe epileptic seizures. So people who would have, you know, like, debilitating seizures, you know, like, Frequent, you know, and then and where they, you know, be incapacitated for a number, an amount of time. So this is like seriously, you know, detrimental to their life, right? Because um, there's you know levels of epilepsy, but but anyway, in these severe cases, like of course they needed something, something to alleviate that and make their, their lives better. And uh, and they discovered that uh, I don't know how it was discovered, but um, or I suppose it was you know people noticed you know stuff and then hypothesized and then performed the experiment and then. It, it had the effect, and, and so it became a, a treatment that they did on a number of people, probably still do, um, uh, where they go in, it's brain surgery, and they go into the brain, and they, so you have two hemispheres in your brain, and there's a, uh, and they're distinct hemispheres, but there's there's these connections um, between the two hemispheres, and, uh, you know, there's a lot of these connections um, that, you know, exist in that rift, um, you know, between, or at the juncture, um, uh, where the two hemispheres sit next to each other, and there are these physical, you know, n- um, neurons or however they are, like these physical um, uh, neurological connections between the two hemispheres. Well, this treatment for severe epileptic seizures is to sever all of those connections. So, um, so it's a pretty, yeah, I guess, pretty straightforward surgery, and they just, you know, you know, cleanly, you know, cut um, the two hemispheres of the brain. Uh, in half, or, or just sever those connections that are there, um, which apparently are not, you know, necessary for uh, brain functioning, because um, people people continue then to function as they as they had before, but without these epileptic seizures. And I I don't when I was reading this, it would have been yeah, a number of years ago, ten years ago, approximately. Um, and even then, I think that uh, that research was a little bit older. But uh, um, I don't think so. They didn't know why why that would work. Why it would you know, stop these severe epileptic seizures, but, um, but, you know, it absolutely was effective. And, um, and so they did it on, you know, many people. Well, then, uh, you know, then we, what we had were, you know, this, this small group of people then who have undergone this procedure and people started, uh, uh, testing. In fact, it probably was part of, you know, the whole experimentation of doing it, you know, and developing it as a, a therapy, um, or as a treatment for epilepsy. But, uh, but there was, you know, all these um, uh, tests that they would, you know, put these people through um, to, you know, to gauge their, you know, their cognitive functioning. And, uh, and yeah, they were normal in, like, you know, most regards. But <laughs> there is... There's always a but. Yeah. So, but the, the thing is, the but is, this is why it's so interesting. Um, uh, I mean... It's completely unanticipated, and it, it delves right into the, the the ancient and fundamental philosophical issue of identity. Um, and right, so the but is one of these, um, or you know, battery of procedures they would or tests they would do upon these people is they would uh, physically separate their left and right eyeballs. They'd put a physical barrier like down their nose. So that their left and right um, eyeballs were receiving, you know, separate information. Um, uh, you know, basically dividing their visual, visual field into, you know, two separate halves. Um, okay, which you can do with anyone, right? Yeah. Um, and then, uh, what they did is they, they gave them, you know, uh, I don't know how the actual you know, physicality of it was, if they put a pencil in the, their hands or if they had a typewriter or whatever. But anyway, they, or just, I don't know. But they had a way for indication for their left hand and the right hand, like a way that they could, you know, record, you know, 
words or whatever responses. Um, uh, and then, um, so we have these people and their, their visual field is divided into two and they have their left and, and then the, so their right and left hands then are, are separated and each of them can, you know, can respond. And then they would give them uh, pictures um, you know, or some, you know, stimulus, you know, again, the specifics don't matter, but, you know, it's all this, this where this data goes, um, or this information. So they give them, you know, it's like, say, you know, a picture of an apple, and they would ask them, you know, to indicate what they saw. Like, I don't know how it was, like, write down, you know, what they saw. And so they'd show a picture of apple, and then, you know, each field, and they would write down apple with, you know, the right in their hand and the left hand. Well, then they they they'd go and they'd show an apple to the left eye and they'd show an orange to the right eye. And they say, write down what you see. And the left hand would write apple and the right hand would write orange. The fact is that they would write down two separate things. Right. Like... Not apple and orange. Right. Just apple or orange. Yeah. Right. And okay. it would correspond to that eye. And, you know, they would... It would be different if they go, you know, like, um, like have them speak it. It's like, say what you're seeing. Because then they would, you know, not respond with, you know, they'd be like, oh, there's, a, you know, an apple and an orange. But when they were told to write it down, they would always do that. They would always be two separate responses. And, and they would be seemingly unaware of that fact. Like, they, they wouldn't be able to write it like they wouldn't be able to indicate otherwise when it's just just the hands like responding yeah um like i said it was totally unanticipated and and it's bizarre but then the implications become profound because it sparked this you know philosophical question what is what is the mental state in that brain case like what is going on in there? How can it be that you're getting two separate responses on each half of the body? Um, and you know, the, the the hypothesizing about it was, I mean, you're trying to like map the brain, like like what is going on in there? And and the the one you know obvious response is well, there's there's two mental states, like there's two mental environments in that brain or in that skull I mean um, because they're not interacting with each other like that's the whole point like that procedure cuts right the connections between the left and right hemisphere and so the question is like well <laughs> does this mean that there is there's there are two entities there are two people there are two personalities inside that skull because they're not interacting with each other. And yet, they can still... When you remove that barrier, that physical barrier between their left and right side, they still function as human beings. Like, they you know, they interact with all the rest of us just the same. Where, obviously, there's an information exchange must be taking place between their two hemispheres. But, but nonetheless, like, it's, it's consistent and... and Unswervable. Like once you divide their their visual fields, you it seemingly is two different mental states. Um, and so, right. So the the like the debate then that comes it came in neuroscience, and I don't know how far philosophers got into it because it is it's so it, it deals right. I mean, fundamental questions of philosophy like what is a person? What are you? Right. What is identity? What does this? What does it mean? How do you you know signify it? How do you define it how do you you know identify identify identity and um and yeah we have this belief like it's because it's our, ex our lived experience of like we have this notion of i like every human language has a connotation for i as the individual like an individual right. actor and we and we think of it as a, a an existence like it has its own unique existence but this issue with people having two separate brain hemispheres directly challenges that because it's <laughs> like how can they have two separate mental states and yet still be 
you know, one person when those states are at least allowed to share information, you know, like having two eyes, you know, right. and sharing one visual field, like, or, or speaking with their mouth, which, you know, seems to yeah, form like one, you know, one entity. But it's, it's so like the, 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 um, thinking about it then is like trying to come up with what is actually going on in the human brain and conscious like how can it be that there's two mental states because they didn't want to go that far no one wants to say like oh there's two people now actually, right. right even though that's what it indicates that there's two separately existing independently existing mental states so could it be taken so far as in those people that their left hand could stab someone with a knife and then their right side could say, well, I had nothing to do with this because it was all thought up by that side. That is interesting. Um, no one, had, I, nothing I was reading, like, went into that. Um, because the thing is, it, it, like, it only manifests itself when it's divided. Like, otherwise, okay. like, that's the thing. They, they are human. They're just, you know, because clearly, like, the, the, the hemispheres are communicating then or sharing information then and, and presenting, producing this identity. Um, but, but it's, but, but it's so easy to like to create seemingly two right. states just by physically just by the yeah separate and so um vision. but other you know when it's, when that's physical separation is out there then they're just like they're just really human and there's no yeah excuse me, no conflict but this conflict is is there it's like because they can't even articulate like that left hand cannot write orange because the apple is in front of that left eye mm-hmm. like it just it can't there's no orange there. Right. And so, um, uh, so then the idea is like, well, are there two mental states in there? And then and they're trying to think of like, you know, that's 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 too bizarre. It can't it can't be that there's two people. I mean, it comes a question like, what is a person? Um, and so no one wanted to accept that. And then so what common thing was like they're trying to say, well, there is one person in there, but you know, there's two like sensory issues. But but that it was it's completely unsatisfactory because. You have to identify, you have to define a person, and it, it always comes down to, right, if they're taking in input and responding to it, like, that's that's a model of a person, and you have two separate right. things doing that yeah. in this skull. And so, um, anyway, the, the, the article I read was um, uh, by a neurologist who had a, what he considered a novel and adequate solution to it but one that is not popular amongst humans. And he, he drew it from uh, ancient Buddhist philosophy. Let me try and explain. Okay. Yeah, it's, oh, it's something. Like I say, it's, yeah, it's actually dangerous. For who? For anyone who comprehends it. Um. Yes, exactly like that. Like it's it's interesting because it, that's right. That that um, that tenet of cosmic horror, um, or particularly like Lovecraftian fiction, that there is forbidden knowledge that that human brain like encounters this and comprehends it. It, it, and it, goes mad. it will go mad. It will not be sane and will not be able to live in this world as it had. Um, uh, and that, like, that sanity, you know, is like an enlightening. But it's, it's an enlightening to the, the horribleness. <laughs> you know, so, so it can be sought and welcomed, yet it is destructive. Um, okay, so anyway, yeah, so that this question, like, the that is forced by our our knowledge that we have of how there seems to be different mental states in one brain um, or in one skull, anyway. Um, and so the question is: well, So, what is what is a, a person? Like, wh- where does the person exist? How do you define it? Um, and because we can only conceive of it as like a mental state, like that is a person. Um, so anyway, they were arguing about it because is, is there one person in the in the epileptic's 
brain or is there, are there two people in there? You know, and yeah, it becomes a question of, of definition. Um, anyway, this, this one um, writer, he had come up with a, another solution to it or answer to this question of how many people are there in a, a person's brain um, who had undergone this procedure to treat epilepsy. Um, and his, his answer, like I said, draws from ancient Buddhist philosophy, unpopular Buddhist philosophy, um, and, and also connects to some of the other like neurological case studies, evidence that we have going back before this treatment of epilepsy, having to do with brain injury. Um, Because that goes back, you know, through hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, I think they even have records from medieval medicine on brain injury. Um, Because people can sustain, you know, injuries to their skull and their brain matter and survive that. Um, so we have thousands of people who've done that, and we have documents, documentation of, upon their um, recovering their lives, and and it's familiar to you. Like most people are aware of this, that like people who suffer like these, you know, large brain injuries, like you know, a spike being driven through like their skull, and like it destroys a, a portion of their actual brain mass, and they survive and they recover and. Then, forever after, all of the people who knew them before the brain injury say that they are now a different person. Right? Of course you've heard that. We all know that. Like, that's common. Because um, brain injuries are common. Like, you know, many people know it firsthand. And, and that's, that is always consistent. Like, the person is not... They don't say it's just like, you know... I mean, it, again, it varies, you know, by the brain injury or the, or the location of the brain injury, but, you know, that's the reportage of, of everyone who who is familiar with brain injuries. It's like, it's a different person. Right. Like, yeah, there's elements that are the same, but, but you know, it, it can be se- very severe where they say the personality is completely different. Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's not even recognizable. Like, it's a completely different person. But it's, you know, it's always like s- there's changes. And, um, well... I mean, it, it, that's tying to that same question. Like, so what is the person? Where is the person? How can it be that, you know, by destroying like a, you know, 1% of their brain, that now the person that existed before does not exist? And this new person exists. Where did that person go? Who is this new person? What is their connection to the old person? Um, The solution, which is, you know, this proposed understanding of it is elegant. But like I said, it's it's contrary to most humans' beliefs. Um, because we, like, and it's common across cultures, but it's not universal, but it's but it's pretty common. Like, like I said, every language has a, a word for I. Um, you know, this belief that, that we are, we are a, a, an identity. So this, this, uh, this writer described this, this alternative um, perspective on it rather than thinking there's, you know, there's one person, you know, in, in the epileptic's brain who's, who now has different, you know, mental states, or there's actually two people in there because because a person is a mental state. Um, he said, well, and, and it's, it's a difficult argument. He said, well, n- this solution is that there are no people in that person's skull because there were no people in it before the procedure. Because person doesn't have a distinct existence. Because what we think of as a 
person, what we think of as our self, is an illusion. What does exist is a collection of thoughts, which are ideas and emotions and memories, but that's all they are. They're just an agglomeration. They don't form a thing that is somehow of a separate existence or a a cohesive existence. It is simply these pieces. And we think that you know, these pieces form this whole that we then call our self, but, but the evidence we have is that those pieces can and are taken away, and there's still this thing that's existing, now it has fewer of these pieces. Okay, it's, it's like I said, an elegant solution is to understand, well, there is no actual person there's only this belief in a person, this illusion that I exist. And, and so he said, like, that, it, he went back and, like, yeah, there is a precedent in, you know, world human thought, and it's um, from ancient Buddhist philosophy, and it was, I don't, I don't know where, which writings he took it from, but... Um, uh, he was describing, yeah, this is, it, it's very unpopular. It's not, it's not known. It's not a part of any practicing Buddhist um, uh, uh, sex. Um, but that it is in the literature that was one of the things that the Buddha, Gautama Buddha, um, perceived and articulated. And it's called the Buddha theory of no personhood. Um, and, and it's exactly that, that, that you think that you exist, but you do not. You yourself are an illusion. And, and why is it, it's a dangerous idea? Like, that's actually what Buddha said about it. Like, he told his acolytes, do not preach this because this can lead to or like almost necessarily leads to like if someone adopts it or I mean even to comprehend it it's, it's difficult because like uh, getting the ramification the implication of it but like to to fully comprehend it it, it leads to a disregard for your own existence because you don't exist so any <laughs> i mean yeah any action to prolong your existence is unnecessary because there is no possibility to prolong something that doesn't even exist and and how that implication plays out and this is the hard thing for to really comprehend, and it's, it's, and it's, it's, it's so interesting. It's, it, it's so unique, and yeah, and like I say, dangerous. Like you won't encounter it, but it is also, it's, it's hard to access. Is that okay? Because you, and the reason you'd mentioned like downloading your consciousness into a machine. Okay. Um. There's other like more familiar thought experiments that deal with with this and can sh- sh- provide some illumination. And the, um, the one is uh, um, like the the thought experiment. Um, and again, this is directly about identity. Um, about like uh, say science fiction technology, like a, a matter transporter, like they can transport matter across distances through uh, a changing from the matter into energy, energy form, or a set of data, transmitting that, and then, like, you know, 
reconstructing or transforming that matter back in, or that energy back into matter or reconstructing you know new matter fitting the exact specifications that were you know detailed from the, the original form right so so say we have a matter transporter and we put you into it now you can travel across the globe or you know even further you know very quickly so there's obviously a you know advantage to you know using the travel right okay <laughs> say um and this is actually familiar from some, you know, published science fiction. But say then you, um, although not all, as many avoid the question. But uh, say you go into this transporter and it's going to transport you, you know, to your vacation destination, um, and uh, uh, and the process of doing that is it's it's going to um, say it's it's going to change you into energy and it's going to beam that energy that is you then over to the destination and it's going to reconstruct you into new matter out of that energy. And like, okay, that sounds fine. Like do that. Okay, well, um then there's ways to think of it. Say that well in that transfer, you know, yeah, it's it'll be the same energy. It's still you, that matter that was now energy. And um and even most matter is is mostly energy. It's just like the connections between like the the you know, atomic, you know, um, uh, pieces, but, um, anyway, so you come into, you know, a pure form energy reconstructs you, but when it reconstructs you, like it's, it's not going to be 100% efficient. It's not gonna be able to reconstruct you with a hundred percent of, of the molecules that it started with, you know, before it beamed you, it's only going to be able to construct you with 99% of them. So 1% it's going to have to draw from somewhere else, you know, and, and input like new material to reconstruct you. So, you know, is that acceptable? And this is like, they do like um, surveys of people like, you know, uh, and most English speakers, whoever it is, like usually college students when they do these things, um, respond, yeah, okay, you know, like for the benefits of like, you know, instant travel, like, yeah, 1%, you know, sure, like, mm -hmm. yeah, um, uh, and then, but then it's right. You can just extrapolate. Okay, the question goes. Well, okay, say it's going to be it's going to be eighty percent efficient. So twenty percent of you is going to be like a new. It would be new matter. You start to be like, would you? And like, well, still okay. Yeah, you know, you still have you have fewer people, but still a lot of them say. And it goes. Well, how about fifty percent? What if when you're reconstructed, only half of you is what the original was, and now half of you has been from new matter. And then, it, then it's like, oh, because because when you say 100 percent, like the answer is sure. And then like go the other way and say, well, for this matter transfer to work, like it's in fact it's not going to transfer it, you as energy. Um, it's going to tear you apart um, and build a map of all of your molecules, and then sh send that data over, and it's going to reconstruct using new matter um, your configuration of molecules with that data but that process of like getting that map of your data is it's just required to like destroy you you know as if you were being butchered essentially i mean it's going to destroy you physically to get that data and then right every, almost every person survey said no i don't want to do that because that's death i would die so that's you know equivalent of saying okay zero percent of your matter is going to be transferred transferred over and then, of course, think of it, you know, phrasing it differently. Well, it's going to transfer your energy and energy and you'll be 100%. Okay, sure, everyone says yes. But then when you go, like, 50%, it's like, well, hmm. Like, that's much... Like, no one has an easy answer for that. It's like, 50% of you will be... It's like, well, yeah. How about 25%? It's like, well, that sounds like death. But 99% doesn't. Um, but you, you understand like the question there, yeah. it's like, where, where is it you and where is it not? Okay. <laughs> and uh, now this is where it gets so interesting and so challenging because, um, you're talking about just the physical you know, molecules that are composing what you call your body. Um, 
and you're saying, okay, so 50% of them will be different, you know, one second from now. And you say, I don't, I don't like that, you know, or just say, or say 90% of them are going to be different. Like, no, that's, you're going to be murdering me. Like that's 90%, like, no, 90% difference. I don't want that. Okay. Well, <laughs> the reality of our existence as this physical form is that our molecules do not persist through our lives. Like the molecules that we are composed of when we are born are not the molecules that we're composed of when we're 10 years old. Like they have been completely changed. We're made up of entirely other molecules. I think it's seven, every seven years, I think is what they the mathematically work it out to that in seven years time, like a human body is composed of entirely different material. Like the matter, the mass of it is not the same as it was seven years ago. I think it's just do it by a percentage as your cells are regenerating. And like and that's, you know, what it works out to over time. Okay. So in seven years from now, all of the material that makes you up will not exist as it does. Like that configuration of material that you will then call you is completely 100% different from the configuration of material that you call you today. Yeah, but you still have all your memories. So experience Hold on. is a memory. Hold on. So, and, and the configuration of you that you call you today, like this, all these molecules are 100% different from the configuration of you of seven years ago. Okay. The challenging question is, is that different from the transporter that destroys you 100% and recreates you out of new matter in another location one second from now? The only difference is, this one took seven years, and this one took one second. For this one second one, that's death to us. Like, oh, that's death. I died. I was completely destroyed, reconstructed. The you of seven years ago is completely dead. You have been reconstructed. And what's the way you said that? The memories, right? Well, that's the thing. Like, the memories, like, if you're constructing the same form, like, those memories are still there, right? Okay. So... So they're going into like the no personhood thing. Um, the no personhood perspective on that, on the transporter thought experiment, where you are now, say it's 100% destruction of your physical matter and 100% recreation of you with new matter. The no personhood perspective is that is no different and what happens in every moment anyway. Like, you cannot die because you do not exist. And what you th think of as, you know, the you of the past, like, you think that you have a direct connection to that physical form that existed yesterday, or seven years ago, or one second ago. You think that this form right now, in this second, in this moment, is directly connected to the, the you that existed a moment ago. But, from this no person perspective, the person, like the, you, the illusion that you call you, is just that agglomeration of thoughts and ideas and memories. There is no actual connection to the you that existed a second ago. In essence, you die in every moment because you cannot be connected to the you that exists in the next moment. That's another agglomeration that just has the memory of this moment. In essence... There is no difference between the transition from this moment to the following moment in which you know, I say that I am alive to the moment of your death. 
from that moment where you are living and the next moment your physical body has been destroyed. Like that transition from that moment from living to death, like the death that you will experience, that, that physical death of your body, it is indistinguishable from every moment. It's <laughs> that's the thing that's so difficult to, to realize. That's the real, like I said, that Lovecraftian forbidden knowledge. Like if you really comprehend that, it's just as Buddha said. Like there's there's nothing to th- to fear or think about or consider because you die in every moment. Like the moment of your death is no different from the moment that just happened. I mean, we partly define a person by the memories and experiences we've had and then how that changes how we relate to other people and ourselves. I mean, so... That's everything still. I, I don't know. There's people who lose their memories. Now, what happens to the person? Are they now no longer the person they were? I don't, th- I don't think so because um, they've, I've often read that people who get amnesia, their personality is different too. <laughs> so, And it's because those memories and experiences are what shape us. I mean, as a person, because I do believe there's a person, but... Well, you know. but that becomes a problem then, because you have to reconcile that belief with these real experiences, that amnesia destroys a person's personality, that these brain injuries... Mm-hmm. I mean, they annihilate a person that no longer exists anywhere. Right. Well, I mean, it, I think it means that the person you are is most definitely connected to your experiences and your memories and all those things. I mean... Right, it's a contradictory state. Like, to believe in a person and, like, and to say then the person doesn't exist or doesn't persist because memories. Like, that's why I say the no personhood theory is an elegant solution to it. It answers all those questions and it does so consistently. It just does so in a way that's like you, you have a visceral reaction to it. It's like, I don't want to believe that I do not exist. I don't want to believe that people do not exist. Like I said, it's not popular. It's dangerous. It is forbidden knowledge. So anyway, like, and this, and this is it directly related to what you said about downloading. This is much more familiar to people because it's been in science fiction a lot and, and we... You know, conceive of it, um, and there's a desire for that immortality because, this, and that comes from a belief in identity. Like I believe that I am a person that I exist, that I have persisted from the last moment, that I am directly that same person. <laughs> that I am the same person I was from seven years ago, even though I've been completely destroyed, as if I were butchered in one second. Nonetheless, like it's a common belief amongst humanity that. As a person, as an identity, they persist through time. And so then there's that desire to want to persist into the future, right? Like they don't have a non-fear of death as, you know, a person who took in and internalized no personhood would have no fear of it because it's no different from any other moment. Instead, with that belief in an identity that persists, then there's a desire to avoid that death moment because it seems like a stoppage of something that exists rather than that thing stopping in every moment. So because of that, then it's popular, like this idea of, well, I can just download my consciousness into like some other medium, some other physical form to support this consciousness. Okay. Okay. (laughs) This gets really interesting because we're, we're, accumulating data on this. Um, and it, 
yeah, it, it, it speaks directly to those same questions, like of how do you even identify what a person is? How do you define a person? Um, so the Turing test, of course, is, you know, that's a, a point for uh, machine intelligence to reach where if a human interacting with it cannot tell if it is a machine or a person. Okay. Right, you know the Turing test, like that's right. an yeah, old thing. Okay. Yeah, so, um, and that's, that's, I mean, it doesn't have like any, it's not meant to have any significance other than like that's just a point that, to be achieved by machine intelligence. Like, oh, like it's, it's thinking in such a way that is, you know, s- similar enough to person, to human thought. Like that's just, that's just a point of development. Um, you know, and that means like through any, like through a medium of, of an interchange, like so not necessarily like, um, it would be through language probably because that's how humans communicate with one another through language, through human constructed language. Um, well, there's already, I think it's argued, I think it might even be accepted, I'm going to read more of like the current stuff on it, that that point has been reached by, you know, machines because there's, you know, just chat bots, like people interact with the, and it is indistinguishable. They cannot determine if that's a person or a machine. Like that is a passing of the Turing test. Right. Um, and, you know, machine intelligence has reached that level already. Um, uh, we think, yeah, when we get to like building like human-like, you know, Android type robots and then like, putting intelligence into them, that we can expect, you know, that that science fiction, you know, Blade Runner kind of scenario, like it's, you know, if it's indistinguishable from human, okay. But, like, that's part of science. Like, you have to determine what the medium is going to be for interaction. And like I said, we already have that chatbot interaction where they do pass the Turing test. Okay. Facebook. Is this repository of data of human action and human interaction between humans okay and so this a couple years ago um a i mean there's people studying this it's all emergent of course there's a, a writer um like how I say this speaks to the question of identity. So there's a writer who's a professor of uh, computer machine interaction um, or you know computer science or some other kind of philosophy, and um, he was American. Anyway, he uh, he was active on Facebook. He would post regularly, and a lot of people interacting with him. He passed away, um, but his he had scheduled his Facebook posts to, you know, go on. I don't know if they were triggered by his death or if they had just like a regular, you know, regularly scheduled post. But anyway, they went like three months on after he passed away. You see, there was a continuity. There was no break. Like his Facebook identity persisted. Um, and that's comprehensively. You say, oh, okay, so that data was there and like it went on um he had produced it and but but see the the issue then is is that interaction and where identity where we define it because as far as facebook his facebook identity and his facebook relationships were he had not died he was still alive there we can kind of understand that um okay (laughs) <laughs> Facebook has algorithms. They had already a couple years ago. I'm sure it's developed even more. Has algorithms where, after a, an amount of data has been, you know, entered by a person, you know, like interacting with Facebook, posting things, liking things, responding to other posts, all of their interaction with the database of Facebook um, or the website of Facebook, and then all that being stored in database. And once there's a, a body of that data, there are algorithms that Facebook already had, like I said, a couple years ago, that can use that data 
and generate actions on the website to mimic that person. You know, all the stuff they've done before, it can then predict how it would react, how the person would react to these other things. It can generate content that is as that person would generate themselves. Okay. And they can do that to a level where the human beings that are interacting with the person through Facebook doesn't know that it's not the person doing it, that it is an algorithm using that data set that the person has inputted into Facebook database by interacting with Facebook. Okay. The algorithms that can mimic the person can then, like you can interact with Facebook to that, provide that data set. Once it's there, the algorithms can then use it. You can go off of Facebook. The algorithms can go on creating content as you indefinitely. And all the people interacting with it, it's as if they were acting, interacting with you. There's no difference. That identity that is you now exists independently from you on Facebook. This is not the future. This is now. So, <laughs> this is really great. So, <laughs> so we say we want to have a, want to upload myself into the machine so I have an existence then, you know, after my, my death to be immortal. Well, <laughs> that already exists in Facebook. And it's in a limited form there. It's, it's only in that realm of Facebook. But, you know, then it's easy to go with the questions, well, if, if 90% of your social interaction already today as you live is through Facebook, as many people's is, that's a fact for millions of human beings. Say it's only half of your social interaction. It is a place where you exist as a social identity. As an identity. Like it's where you have agency and take action and respond to stimulus. Like it's, you know, you also do it in so-called meat space. But the fact is like there's a large percentage that you do in this cyberspace. And yes, for many people, it is the majority. So yeah, say you now you stop existing in meat space, you die. But this identity that you have made possible to exist by uploading this information, by interacting with the Facebook website, persists on through these algorithms, and it is indistinguishable for all the people that you interacted with. <laughs> so in that sphere, you are... Now, immortal. You will exist forever as that entity. You have uploaded your identity into the internet. Do you feel immortal? So that's the question. In what circumstance, what other circumstance can you envision where you would feel immortal? How could it be different than you having an identity that, has, that takes action, that is as you are to everyone who knew you anyway? What could be different? What, like it's been done. You've been uploaded. <laughs> and so that whole idea is, you understand, is flawed from the beginning. Like that idea, well, I can upload myself and I'll live forever. Uploading yourself is not going to make you live forever. It's, it's going to create an identity separate from this, this physical identity. It, and it's not problematic from the no personhood perspective because, yes, you've created this thing that, that is indistinguishable from you. 
it's, it's not you. You can't upload yourself because you don't exist anyway. Like there's nothing for you to upload. There is only this set of responses and, and creation and, and interaction. But that, does, I mean, when you say that, that doesn't explain why the memories persist. You still remember back to when you're four years old. So The memories are just how the neurons are routed. Like, it's just a map. We can map that. Like, that, that is the idea for building a replica human brain or recreating human brain. Like, we can open up your skull, take you apart, but create a map and put it into a machine, and it will have all of those memories. Because their memories, as, you know, if we think of them as just that physical mapping, which they seem to just be, just neurons, those connections that are created through the experience of living in this body. It's just a physical mapping. We recreate it, and now those memories persist in this entity. Do you feel immortal? No. So then that's the thing. There is no way for you to feel immortal. There's no way for you to upload. There is nothing for you to upload from the no person perspective. You are just an agglomeration of memories. There are not they are not you. There is no you. Well, I mean I don't agree with that, but Right. It's 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 a conundrum. You know, what is identity? And there is no Good answer, like I say, the no personhood answer is an elegant one, but it seems so alien to what we want to believe about ourselves. So, as I said, like that, that illumination, that dangerous knowledge, like, yeah, we want to believe that we have an existence. And then you get a glimpse of what the truth may be, and it is not what we want. Isn't it interesting? Yeah, it's very interesting. Well, but here's the difference. I will then go and have different experiences, and I will learn new life lessons, and so that thing on Facebook, that algorithm you say is downloaded, that would, stay the, that would remain static, no, wouldn't it? No, can do that as well. That's one of the interesting things that comes out from uh, from this idea of uploading your identity. So, so we don't like the idea of like say, okay, we got we can upload your identity into a machine. You will live forever. To do it, we have to destroy your brain. We have to take it apart and map it. Okay, when we get it uploaded, it'll live forever. And you say, no, I don't want to do that because that seems like death. Okay, then say, well, we can do it without having to destroy your brain, and we'll upload that your personality into it. So they do that, and you continue to exist as you are. Now there's a personality existing in this machine that is that was you, that's perfectly mapped. It's you. You've been uploaded. But the two of you go on existing now. But again, the question is, do you feel immortal? No, because you know that your, your physical body is still going to die, and that consciousness that you think you are is going to cease. And this other thing is now existing fully in that electronic space. As time goes by, it develops differently than you do because now it's having experiences and gaining new memories and new knowledge oh. different from you. Oh, that's weird. Right, and it's fundamental. Like, that's, that's an issue. So it's more like a clone. Right. So the question is, in what way can you possibly be uploaded? Because say, you know, you don't like the idea where to map your brain, we have to destroy it. You don't like that because then you feel like you die to create it. Okay, so we say, well, we'll be able to map it, but you won't die. So we map it and put it in there. You continue living. And now you diverge. Like these personalities diverge because they're now, this was totally different lives you're living. You say, well, again, I don't feel like immortal. So would you rather that we map it it doesn't destroy your brain. We upload you. This Now you go on living with new experiences in this electronic existence. So we just kill you. So we don't have the two diversion. Is that better? What is the scenario where you're going to be uploaded and you feel immortal? 
Like, that's the question. I guess, to me, what would be immortal would be that we keep our brain, and but they just replace all of our other body parts. Okay. But your, say your brain deteriorates as well. We have to replace your brain. So now 10% of your brain, because that's true, too. Like, we have the idea, yeah, our, we have like a 90-year lifespan on this, the physical, the organs and so on. But we figure, they, you know, that the neurons can go for like 200 years, that your brain can remain functioning for 200 years. So say we replace your heart as it goes bad and your liver as it goes bad and your kidneys and so on. You can go on for 200 years, but, but the brain deteriorates. The brain tissue starts being destroyed. It deteriorates. So it needs to be replaced. Well, we replace it with electronics. So now you have 10% of your, you still have your meat body, but now you have 10% of your brain is now electronic. And then next year it's 20%. <laughs> Next year it's 30%. Yeah. And a few years it's 100% electronic. The result, of course, is no different if we had just totally taken your brain and put it in a machine and killed you. Yeah. Now that you still have this body that is now most, you know, all the organs are mechanical, and now you have a brain that's 100% electronic, do you feel immortal? No. So what we've arrived at is that, I mean, this is a fundamental change then from where we started because you said, I would like to be uploaded to be immortal. But where we've just arrived at, you seem to recognize that yeah, that's impossible. It does sound impossible. That's kind of significant, isn't it? I mean, to, yeah. to understand that. And then also how no personhood illuminates that. Isn't it interesting? Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, that's why I want to finish that book. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, like I said, I've told this to some people, and that, that's always the reaction. It's, it's, it's something. Like, that's really, really something. And where we are already today with our technology, it's forcing these ideas. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, the stuff you see in science fiction, it, it's not... It's not, I haven't seen anything that really deals with it like that because, you know, there's that, that, right. there's that pervasive belief. It's that, like I say, it's in every culture, like that belief in identity, I. What we were talking about before that, like, enhanced humans, you know, like combining. Transhumanism, sorts, yes. Yeah. I mean, that would sort of factor into that same question. When would you mm. stop being you? Like how much exactly. enhancement before you wouldn't really be you? Exactly. And again, it's elegantly explained by no personhood. And you're just a bunch of thoughts and memories anyway, and there's no connection between you and any of the past iterations of you, nor any of the future iterations of you. That you have died from this moment to the next. I can't accept it because, to me, your memories are what keep you, your memories and experiences are what make you you. So as long as you still have those, I just, yeah, I can't accept that. And when all of your memories are destroyed, did you die? Your personality, yeah. I mean, so you're saying if your memory's destroyed, but your body's still living. Well, I mean, there's people who have that injury. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like that's what a personality is. So, yeah. They so is a personality like, a person? I don't know. Right. That's, that's the question. That's another question. Yeah. No, it's, it is this question. Because you're saying, I don't believe that. I believe that as long as you have the memories, then you are, that's what you are. But where did you go if your memories are now gone? Are you dead? Well, I guess, is a person their personality? Right. That's the question. What is identity? And that's why that no personhood is, idea is, like I said, compelling. It provides an answer to it. And otherwise... Yeah, what answer is there?
So a belief in an eternal soul, right? So that's a that's a magical belief, and that is the common human response to encountering death, yeah. to deny it. Right. To, to, I mean, that's what almost every religion has some form of mm-hmm. life after death. Right. Because it is abhorrent to deal with the facts and their implications. And as I said, that implication is dangerous. It's forbidden knowledge. You're applying to live forever in Facebook? Not Facebook. I mean, you will already. You will yeah, live. Not Facebook. I mean, just to... Oh. The idea would be, you know, that you would have your consciousness, you would have your memories, and you could go on living in something, you know... In meat space? I guess that actually seems more viable because you said if your brain can live 200 years and our bodies give out in, in usually in our 80s or, you know, so yeah, it sounds like you could, the best you can hope for is maybe to extend your life to that 200 years by replacing everything but your brain. It sounds like though once you replace your brain, you're basically done. But your brain is replaced anyway. Yeah, but not so much that you're not retaining your memories and your experience. Well, when you replace it with electronics, it will retain that as well. Hmm. Then maybe immortality is possible. I don't know. So we can do it all at once and just destroy this, <laughs> this physical brain matter and recreate it electronically. Well, I didn't say I wanted that to happen now. <laughs> but that's the issue. I think anytime someone's speaking of that, they're speaking of when it's no longer possible for them to live as they right, but, are. But, they're not like signing up for it right away. <laughs> right, but the, the philosophical question, like, are you actually persisting as an identity? Say you're only replacing yourself 1% a year with electronics, but eventually 100% of you is replaced with electronics. Okay, it took you 100 years. Well, let's say it takes you one minute. We replace you 100% with electronics. It leaves a bloody mess of what was your brain on the floor, but it's the same point you've arrived at as if you'd done it over 100 years. Well, no, but you wouldn't... You wouldn't be doing that if you had any other option. So that's why someone doesn't do it in a minute because you're only doing it when there's no possibility of. of well, I mean, say life. the world is ending, like the, oh. the the atmosphere is becoming poisonous to, you know, human yeah, well, life then, forms. Yeah, because you got nothing else to you got nothing to lose. Okay, do you do you feel immortal? Well, I, I don't. I wouldn't know till <laughs> I woke up in. Okay. In the cloud. <laughs> right. Well, you wouldn't wake up. You would be a bloody mess. There would be a thing that would be indistinguishable from you that wakes up and continues on as you were. And that's the same as when you wake up in the morning. Like, what was before, like last night, is a bloody mess. Like, the thing that wakes up in the morning is indistinguishable from what it was last night. But... What was last night is dead. Like I said, it's it's hard to comprehend. But it comes out clearly when you think through that. So, I mean, there's something that lasts, even if their cells are being replaced. The configuration is the same, but the matter is different. Right. 
but they're still themselves. So. Well, we can create that same configuration in a machine. Do you feel immortal? No. Because there's no connection between that configuration and this one. Well, in the same way, there's no connection between this configuration and the one from last night. Buddha said, don't teach it. A glimpse of the truth. <laughs> and it is it's beyond what the human brain can accept. Most humans are going to say, I don't believe that. I believe that I exist. Well, and I think almost all the major religions have basically the concept of a soul. I mean, it's somewhat different how they explain it, but most of them do. You know, so some people it's that their soul is going to heaven, and some religions it's reincarnated. Right, but some kind of existence that is perpetual right. and is not dependent upon the physical body. Right, yeah, almost most of the major religions have some form of that. So that's the, that's, I guess, the, that is the alternate theory. I mean, if you call it a theory, it's one that, that breaks apart when we deal with these, all of these issues that have just been talking about, from uploading consciousness to loss of memory to you know, dividing the hemispheres of the brain. Like, that theory doesn't provide any any explanation of those. Well, I think a good person to pose that to would be more a, you know, see what, like, a theologian would, what their response to, to it would be. Oh, and I can find out what the Catholics think and what Hindus might think. And, right, yeah. like different. Yeah. None of that is truth None of those have any applicability outside of those social contexts. Like, no one can discover, like, the Catholic theology, you know, the way that you do discover the principles of mathematics and physics and chemistry. Like, those are eternal and consistent. They can be lost by civilizations and rediscovered. No one can rediscover Hindu theology. If that knowledge is lost, it's not rediscovered. There's no such thing as truth there. But these issues of the human brain and the neurological damage and trying to upload it into technology, these are questions that would be eternal. Like they'd arise in any era that would resemble ours today. And no personhood would exist as an explanation. That's why I can say it's something more akin to truth, such as like mathematical truths, rather than any theology. Isn't it interesting?